Hey there once again YouTube, how you guys doing? It's been a little while, been pretty busy, but I have time to make a video of some interesting stuff that's been going on lately, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon, and on the Cascadia Subduction Zone, of course, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but first, I just want to remind you about my website. Remember, it can help you teach, or uh, help teach you about, you know, any type of seismic event pretty much, and how to access and download seismic data and how to review that in the seismic program swarm or the program waves or whatever seismic program you use to analyze that stuff if you do have one. And remember to keep an eye on the Steamboat Geyser Eruptions page, Steamboat Eruptions 2019, where I usually upload the pots right after I notice a Steamboat Geyser Eruption has happened in Norris at Yellowstone. It was a few days ago, actually it was almost a week ago, Let's see, it was on November 27th, so we have not had one yet for December, even though today it is December 1st, 2019, technically 7.38 p.m. Pacific time right now. Um, but this is the most recent one, guys, 45th eruption. Yes, Steamboat Geyser has erupted 45 times in 2019, which, of course, if you add in the total of 77 eruptions since it reactivated in 2018, this will definitely make it the most active time period for Steamboat Geyser ever on record. I mean, maybe before we knew about Yellowstone, it might have been more active, but ever since it's been on record, this is definitely the most active time period for Steamboat Geyser and Norris. What that means, nobody knows. But the last one was a 45th eruption, which occurred at 747 UTC on November 27, 2019. Again, I do not do a video every time Steamboat erupts, so if you want to see the plots and you just want to real quick check them out, I will always have them here on my Steamboat Geyser page as soon as I see a Steamboat eruption has happened and as soon as I have time, so as soon as possible there. And remember, the best way to contact me is via email at WashingtonMagma at Yahoo.com. And I have a link to my website in the description box below along with my email address. So you can go check that out below if you wish. Now let's move on. Actually, what am I talking about? Before I move on, I have not talked about this in my videos yet. But I do have something uh, under the more drop down menu called test your knowledge. If you have followed me for a while and you know the types of things I analyze and some of the events I take a look at. Welcome to the knowledge test section of my website where I made this cool little basic seismic events quiz. So come take this, see how well you did and let me know if you do do it and put your results in the description box below. I believe it's like 26 or 27 questions, not that many, but should be fun for you. It's a very basic quiz. So moving on. Now here we have an overlook of recent seismicity in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in Washington State and Oregon. Now uh, this is about 80 reported earthquakes or so in the past week or so, with some very interesting events as of late down here near Coos Bay, Oregon. Here actually, let me turn on the terrain real quick. There we go. So down here actually by Port Orford, not Port Orchard, Washington, but Port Orford, Oregon, we had a 3.5 at 16.1 kilometers in depth right after 4.5 at 16.6 .6 kilometers in depth in a very strange location and at this depth and location I believe it to be related to the subduction process I believe personally that it is related to the Cascadia subduction zone because number one there aren't many known faults in this area I believe but also at the depth in this location it's around the point where the Juan de Fuca uh, plate starts to dip down below the North American plate. So we got the North American plate over here, basically moving this way. And we got the Juan de Fuca plate, basically moving this way. And so we have that subduction process right here as the Juan de Fuca plate dips and melts beneath the North American plate. And that's where we get all of our volcanoes on the Cascade Range. I know probably a lot of you guys understand and know what the Cascadia subduction zone is, but I think it's, cause over here, I don't know the exact depth of the subduction process, and where the subduction starts of the uh, one if you could play over here. But I do know that it's pretty shallow in this location since the subduction seems to start right about here, actually. So, so I believe personally that this was related to the Cascadia subduction zone, but you know, who knows, guys? Who knows? And then recently we had a magnitude 4.1 and 10 kilometers in depth. More recently, a 3.6 at negative 1.3 kilometers in depth, so very close to the surface, at the old extinct Goat Rocks volcano. And we also saw a little earthquake swarm break out on Mount Rainier recently, but I'm going to start off with something else real quick. 
Why don't we take a look at the magnitude 4.5 in Oregon first? Okay, so we see four reported earthquakes. There are probably a few tinier ones that were reported, but that's no biggie. But we did see the magnitude 4.5 struck at 16.6 .6 kilometers in depth near Port Orford, actually under the coast right here. So it wasn't off on the blank of fracture zone like we usually see. So it's very possible, again, this is related to the subduction process of the Juan de Fuca plate dipping under the North American plate, but who knows. 513 did you fill it reports meaning that 513 people got went on this website and reported to usgs that they felt the event and down here the shake alert did confirm that the shake alert did go out for this magnitude 4.5 very very interesting let's see what the closest seismic station is to this event let's see here closest broadband station would be kev in the nc network let's take a look at that now just real quick here we have seismic data from seismic station Keb in the NC network. We're going to take a look at the magnitude 4.5 just real quick. First off, Swarm 3.0.0 did recently come out. So go and download that from the USGS website if you wish to get the most recent update. And actually something pretty cool about the new version is the use alternate color spectrum option right here. And look at here, I have it checked and it'll change it to kind of an older version of a spectrogram would look. I mean, this kind of looks like the old, more vintage spectrograms that you sometimes see online. For example, there's this one event underneath an ocean. It's it, when you search harmonic tremor on Google images, it kind of brings up a lot of different plots from a lot of, a lot of different things. But one of them that I first looked at when I was first getting into this stuff was one with a purple spectrogram, which is opposite of what I was used to really, or what I thought they'd look like. But there's an altered color uh, spectrum right here, which will show the same thing as a normal spectrogram. However, I think this is mainly for people who are colorblind or color sight impaired. You know what I mean? So let's go right back to the regular color spectrum, which is my favorite right here. All right, this is the magnitude 4.5 in Oregon, guys, right here. Look at this puppy dog. Had some very interesting S wave arrivals and possibly T wave arrivals. I don't think those are surface waves since the station was so close. So that could be a T wave arrival right there, which is a, what is it called? Tetrary wave arrival, I believe, which would be a third wave. Because we have the P, which is the primary wave. Then we have the S wave and then the possible T wave right there. It's a very strange looking earthquake, guys. Very, very very odd uh, prior to this there really were not any force shocks at all not seeing any earthquakes prior to the magnitude 4.5 but we of course did see many aftershocks shocks excuse me associated to this event right here very very tiny though there's one right there and one right there but they look very very odd some of these quakes just look very strange to me in my opinion for example, the P wave being stronger than the S wave and a lot of the seismic data I was looking at which is usually kind of weird Usually the S wave is the strongest wave to appear on a seismic station. And here we have 3.5 aftershock many hours later. Same type of earthquake basically as the magnitude 4.5, so obviously related. Now, that's it. Let's move on. So over the past week or so, we did see multiple earthquakes break out at Mount Rainier. And if you guys notice, I'm doing a lot of the Pacific Northwest first, since I do have a lot of viewers from the Pacific Northwest, especially myself. I live in Bothell, Washington, kind of near Seattle, so... A lot of the stuff that's around here does strike home, and quite literally, no pun intended. Um, we did see over the past week some earthquakes break out, actually pretty much in the same day, along the West Rainier Seismic Zone, which is this vertical zone right here, which is mainly due to regional tectonics and possibly even subduction of the Juan de Fuca Plate under the North American Plate, but usually has to do with regional tectonics in this area. But we did see an earthquake storm break out under Mount Rainier, which was quite interesting. And we saw one of the largest earthquakes in a few years, actually. Let's zoom in, shall we? So it wasn't too crazy. Not too many earthquakes reported. I mean, it's a very, very small swarm. But we did see a 2.1 and negative 0.1 kilometers in depth. Remember, 0 kilometers in depth means sea level. So that means it was 0.1 kilometer above sea level, which means it would still be in the volcanic edifice of Rainier itself. So let's take a look at the last time we saw 2.1 strike under Mount Rainier itself. So ever since late 1990, we have seen 90 reported earthquakes for underneath Mount Rainier itself. And that isn't too crazy, but again, the most recent was the 2.1 and negative 0.1 kilometers in depth. But the one, the one that's most recent, that's larger than the 2.1, 
would have to be this 2.8, but that really wasn't underneath Mount Rainier itself. Of course, related to Mount Rainier, probably, but was not actually underneath Mount Rainier itself. You'd have to go to this 2.3 in 2016. So actually, it's been, uh, what, about four years, almost four years, since we have seen a magnitude 2.1 or greater actually underneath the volcanic edifice of Mount Rainier itself. So it's been a few years, nothing too crazy, guys, but I just thought uh, that I'd let you know about that because you never know, guys. Mount Rainier is one to definitely keep an eye on, and it's one that I actually see almost every day driving to work. I see Mount Rainier, so it's definitely a stark reminder of how big it is, and it's pretty big. Another thing I really want to touch bases on was something that happened this morning when I got up. I noticed a big red dot near Mount Rainier when I was zoomed out because I always check the earthquake map every single time the second I wake up. I just like to do that. Um, and I thought a 3.6 because it said 3.6 very shallow hit Mount Rainier. And I was like, wow, that's definitely one of the largest quakes we've had at Rainier for many, many, many years. But actually, to find out when I zoomed in, it was far down here. And you see along the Cascadia or excuse me, the Cascade Volcanic Arc. We have Mount Adams Volcano, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Rainier. But over here, some something that not many people know about is the extinct Goat Rock Strata Volcano over here, or supposedly extinct. And I'll show you my reasons why I say supposedly, because really, if you think about it, magma can pop up anywhere, basically. I mean, that's why Mount Adams is not technically not just Mount Adams. It's considered Mount Adams Volcanic Field. That's what the technical name for this is. So, I mean, volcanoes, small little single eruptive events can happen over here, over here, over here. I mean, they, they don't always happen at the volcano itself. Same with Mount Rainier. I mean, there have been a flank eruptions. I mean, even around this area down there in Indian Heaven Volcanic Field. So, really, people think of volcanoes as it erupting from that single central source. But that's not what always happens. Sometimes volcanoes, or excuse me, volcanic eruptions can sprout from a few miles from the volcano and still be related to that volcano so i i never say anything is truly extinct but people do believe the go rock strata volcano is extinct however magma can pop up anywhere again this morning we saw a magnitude 3.6 guys and negative 1.3 kilometers in depth so very very near to the surface and i saw them jump back and forth the first one i think said negative 0.3 kilometers and then the next one said 2.2 kilometers, meaning they thought it was deeper. And now they're saying they're sticking with the negative 1.3. So they're thinking it's pretty, pretty shallow. Again, it was a 3.6. And we'll take a look at in just a second when the last time Goat Rocks Volcano saw a magnitude 3.6. 20 people reported feeling it, including a few people up near Tacoma reporting very, very, very light shaking. So that's very surprising, but not too surprising, actually. Never mind. That's not too surprising. A 3.6 can travel pretty far. We're going to take a look at the closest seismic station right here just so I can open it up in Swarm because I just want to take a quick look. And I want to take a look at this station right here. The second closest station took only 6.8 seconds to arrive there. So the station isn't too far away and we'll, we'll get a good look at this earthquake on PANH. But first, what is the Goat Rocks Volcano? All right. Goat Rock Strata Volcano, guys. Here is a picture of it right here. Let me try to zoom in on it. Let's see here. Yep, that's the Goat Rock Strata Volcano, where basically the entire volcanic edifice has been eroded away, supposedly, over hundreds of thousands of years. That's what they say. And basically what you're seeing are the cores of the volcano itself, the dikes and the old, the old magma system, basically. I mean, that's basically the old magma system. And so let's go back and see what they say about this area, actually. Now, the Goat Rocks Volcano is located in southern Washington, about 113 kilometers west of Yakima. This region of the Cascades was originally occupied by Native Americans who hunted and fished in its vicinity and used its trails as trade routes. Goat Rocks lies in a zone of intermittent volcanism, which has produced many small volcanic vents, also including the Mount Adams Volcanic Field and Indian Heaven. Situated in the eastern portion of the Cascade Range, Goat Rock, Go, excuse me, Goat Rocks, lies at the northwest corner of the Klickitat River Basin. As a member of the Cascade Volcanoes, Goat Rocks was produced by the subduction of the oceanic Juan de Fuca Plate under the western edge of the continental North American Plate. This fault, known as the Cascadia Subduction Zone, lacks the deep oceanic trench usually found at convergent plate boundaries, which can probably be explained by its slow rate of subduction. According to the United States Geological Survey, the Nazca and North American plates converge at a rate of about 3 centimeters, or 1 inch to 2 inches, 
each year, just half of their convergent rate as recently as supposedly 7 million years ago. Okay, so that's very, very intriguing, guys. So again, the Goat Rocks Volcano is part of a volcanic field. I mean, you can't think of this as Goat Rocks Volcano, Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens. You got to think of it and look at the big picture that it's a volcanic field, which means vents, single erupt event, events where they just erupt once and never erupt ever again, like small cinder cones, small sporadic lava flows, small little tephra eruptions from, a you know, like a flank vent or something. That does happen, and that always can happen. So just because a volcano is extinct doesn't mean something else might not happen near. But I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying... Always keep an eye out for it and monitor it as close as you can. Now, let's take a look at the recent seismicity since, what was it, since 1950 for the Goat Rocks Volcano and see when the last time we saw an earthquake as large as this or larger. So here we have the Goat Rock Strata Volcano right here, guys. That's it right there. Let me turn on uh, satellite real quick and take a look at it. This is the Goat Rock Strata Volcano, supposedly extinct for quite a while, but you know, you never know. But moving on. Uh, since 1950, magnitude 2.0 and above, there have been 37 earthquakes reported again since late 1950, with the oldest in here being 1981. Now, interestingly enough, in 1981, there was a 4.6 and then a 5.0 in this region, basically in the same region as today's 3.6. However, look, remember, today's was the 3.6, a negative 1.3 kilometers in depth in this location right here. To find an earthquake that large or larger, let's go down, let's see, 2.1, 2.1, 3.2, 2.0, 2.4, 2.8, blah, 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 and look, we have to go to the 5.0, yeah, on, what was that, May 28th, 1981, guys, yeah. May 28th, 1981. That's how far you have to go back to find an earthquake larger than the earthquake that happened today. But the earthquake that happened in 1981 is a freaking 5.0, guys. I mean, there are even multiple magnitude twos around that same time frame. So there definitely was a lot of activity in 1981 and calmed down for some time right when it hit about 1983 or so. And then just recently in the 2000s, 2016, we saw 3.1, 2018, we saw 2.5 and 2.4. And then recently, again, 2019, we saw the 3.6. So activity in this area is very sporadic and intermittent, but it's definitely a good idea to keep a close eye on it. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with station P, A, N, H in the CC network. Dash, dash, location code because none is given. Broadband vertical. Since it's a broadband station, I'm going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter to the 8th power. Now, going down, we see basically normal background microseisms that are pretty strong being recorded at the station, actually. Uh, but going forward, here is the magnitude 3.6. Oh, whoops, my recorder glitched out there. Again, this is 3.6 uh, near the Goat Rock Strata Volcano, which struck today the largest to strike that area, actually, since 1981 saw the magnitude 5.0. So, very, very interesting earthquake. Normal high range frequencies, slightly lower frequencies in the S wave, but that's basically no normal. I'm going to take off the filter just to see if there's any strange really low frequencies, and there's not. So there really is no explanation as to what caused this. And going forward, I see no aftershocks. None. And I'm talking about none. Maybe one right there, but I, I doubt it. And still going forward, just randomly going forward afterwards, not seeing a thing. So really, there were almost no aftershocks and no foreshocks to this 3.6. It just happened, and then activity just ceased. Just that one earthquake. So I find that very intriguing as to why that would be. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the description box below. Remember, the best way to contact me is via email. So because I don't always look at the comments of my videos. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but let's move on. Now here we are at pnsn.org slash tremor, which shows tectonic tremor and their reported locations. Now remember, this is only a an epicenter reporting website for tremor. Remember, tremor and earthquakes are completely different. Tremor can last minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, but earthquakes just happen and then go away, you know? Like, they can happen in earthquake swarms, obviously, but earthquakes are a sudden thing instead of, like, a... 
like a very slow going thing, which that's what Tremor is. Tremor is a long and drawn out process. And usually when you see in like news articles, they say, oh, a 4.6 Tremor has just hit Washington or something like that. That's actually incorrect. Technically, Tremor is Tremor and Earthquakes are Earthquakes. You cannot use those interchangeably, but people do all the time. That's why there's so much confusion out there. But recently, Tremor, and you can see, Tremor has been very sporadic, guys, over the past few months. Even here, let's go back. Let's go back to 2019. All of the year, Tremor has been very, very sporadic and erratic. It's just been very intermittent. Stop, starts again, stop, starts again. In many different weird locations, too. So, it's very confusing. Even some of these seismologists have no idea what is going on with our subduction zone. But then again, we've only been monitoring tectonic tremor for a while. Now, as the subduction zone, you know, remember I talked about the Juan de Fuca plate in the, along the Cascadia subduction zone, how it goes underneath the North American plate. Sometimes that process speeds up. And as it speeds up, it starts to slip and move and move. And because it's moving so quickly, I mean, we can't really feel it. But because it's moving so quickly, it creates tremor, and that is detectable on seismic stations. And the slip, which is how the ground shifts over a long period of time, actually is shown up on GPS stations. Now, I did talk about this on my website recently, actually. Right here, let's see. Go to my Seismo blog, and of course I will have a link to this in my description box below, a link to this specific blog post. Talk about ETS tectonic tremor, an example of what actually the seismic arrivals of tectonic tremor, what these seismic events actually look like via a seismogram and spectrogram plot from two closest stations to each event I try to look at. So go take a look at that if you wish. But yeah, ETS has been very sporadic, guys. Here, let's press search. Since Thursday the 7th, guys, since Thursday the 7th of November, Look at that, guys. Filling in basically the whole Cascadia subduction zone down here. Got a little bit of a patch that's open right up here, but very, and it's been very, very intermittent, very sporadic. I believe the strongest we've seen this year has actually been in the southern port of Vancouver Island, which has been seeing an ETS recently calmed down. Still don't know what the heck is going on or why ETS is acting this strange because it's never really been acting like this before. But, but then again, we've only been knowing about it since about 2002 or so. So, cut us a little break. But, moving on. Alright, what the heck is this, you may be wondering? Well, something very weird that I discovered recently. Now, if you want to do some, um, some extended research as to where this actually occurred, you can if you want. But I've been trying to pinpoint an epicenter. It's very, very hard. Um... So, let's go to the map that I wanted to do real quick. Let's go to GMAP, which is the Iris GMAP, which I use to find all my seismic stations to gather data from. Now remember, if you guys want to learn how to do all this stuff, just use my website. I have a lot of how-to pages under the how-to drop-down menu teaching you just how easy it is to monitor tectonic and volcanic hazard areas just from the comfort of your own home, basically becoming your own seismologist at home. Of course, you got to learn a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of research and not just do that, but... But if you have the tools necessary, it will help you learn a lot quicker than if you were just to read out of a textbook. Okay, so what I wanted to do down here is... So, in Nevada, there were some earthquakes going on. There was an earthquake swarm, I believe... Let's see, where was it? Where was it? It was up here near Warm Springs. I think it was right about this location in Nevada or something like that. I'm going to do a location box. Draw boundary. Now, somewhere in this location, there were some seismic stations that picked something up because, you know, I downloaded data from a lot of the nearby stations in this area just to take a look at the earthquake swarm that was going on up here to see if anything concerning was happening. Nothing really. It, it really was not that important. And that's not what I'm talking about in this video. I'm talking about something that I found while looking at the earthquake swarm. So, earthquake swarm happened up here. I took data from a few of these stations, including this one probably right here. Actually, no, I didn't. Never mind. Uh, so, ooh, where was this? What? Where's the station I took data from? Oh, I, it was this one right here. I took data from that one. And then I also took data from this array. I noticed there's an array of seismic stations in this location in Nevada right here. And I thought that was very strange. So I took some data from here to take a look at the earthquake swarm that was going on. Looked at the earthquake swarm then kind of moved on. But then I noticed something weird. That was this. I noticed this. And it was a, about, let's see, 
ignore this event right at the beginning. That is a regional event, probably a distant earthquake. I don't know where the earthquake happened, but since the arrivals are exactly the same on all these stations, but the arrivals of this are delayed, then that means that this is definitely a regional event over here. But starting right here at about 2127, some strange emergent event. It's very strange. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 earthquakes struck in a very rhythmic pattern. I mean, look at this pattern, guys. It is very, very intriguing. And this lasted only about seven minutes, actually. Very, very enigmatic, very mysterious, guys. I don't know what could cause this, especially since a different type of seismic event started at 2127. It was emergent, it was tremor-like, and had some low to mid-range frequencies, and then we see these earthquakes. And then basically nothing ever since, guys. Nothing ever since. But let me show you from this station, which I found to be the best station to, to take a look at them from, which is this station right here, SNSTC. I used all of the stations possible in this whole area, and STC had the closest arrival time, meaning that it arrived on this seismic station first. I'm not able to judge a perfect epicenter, but is my guess it occurred somewhere up here, southwest of Rachel, Nevada, somewhere in this location, out in the literally the middle of nowhere. And there's some weird like military installation looking things out here. So maybe it was the military, but it really was very, very uh, rhythmic, just odd, just an odd, odd event. So I'm going to take the data from STC, plug it into Swarm and see if any have happened recently and to also show you what it looked like in person, even though obviously I already showed you a spectrogram of it, but we're going to take a look at it real quick. Now, earthquakes are happening all the time out in Nevada. You may, you may not think of Nevada as earthquake country, but it definitely is. And I was looking at the earthquake swarm that was going on, including some of these earthquakes, which did, which did take part of the earthquake swarm. I believe a few high magnitude twos and magnitude three or so. But then I noticed something very rhythmic right here. So I took a look at this, and I see that obvious emergent event indicative of some type of regional event. And then I see this tremor-like event start at about 2127. Keep going forward. Look at that. And it only lasted about seven, eight minutes or so. And that's about it. And this is the event right here. And I have not seen it before this. I looked many, many months prior and I have not seen it after. It's a very once in a lifetime unique type of thing. And you notice that even amongst the earthquakes, you can see this tremor event does continue throughout this entire process. You can see it kind of end right over here. So the tremor and these earthquakes are definitely related somehow. I don't know how, but there are definitely two sources or excuse me, two processes taking place to cause this seismic event. Again, only lasted about seven minutes, but it was very, very rhythmic. And ever since then, we have been seeing seismicity in Nevada increase a bit. We're seeing a few uh, kind of look like regional events, but I'm not sure what these are. I'm going to definitely take a closer look into this. And you could definitely could tell the P and S wave arrivals are kind of separated. So it is kind of at a different location than the earthquakes that I showed you just a second ago that were rhythmic. But still, it's very interesting some of the stuff that's going on in Nevada recently. Seismicity seems to be increasing, but I'm not sure from where or exactly why it would be. Going forward, we see normal background noise, normal earthquakes. Well, excuse me, not normal, but, you know. I don't know how normal they are. We might see another burst of four right there, but I don't know if that's a real seismic event or surface noise. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but yeah, we are definitely seeing a good, interesting activity in Nevada. So definitely keep a close eye on it. I'm keeping a close eye on the station to see if that rhythmic event happens again. I contacted the Nevada Geological Laboratory. I think that's what they're called to talk to them about it. They still have not gotten back to me about what the heck that was. I was just calling or excuse me, emailing to ask, is it like a mind blast, a rhythmic mind blast for seven minutes. I mean, that really wouldn't make sense. Ten mind blasts in seven minutes, in my opinion, would not really make sense, especially since there was tremor. But still, I wanted to cover all my bases. So they still have not gotten back to me about that. So we'll, we'll take a look at that email if and when it does come in. Now, here we are. It is this thing on .org <clears throat> for the seismographs at Yellowstone. Notice we did see an earthquake swarm on the 30th. Uh, yes, on the 30th, we did see an earthquake swarm. Kind of cut 
off at the top here a little bit, but we'll take a look at it in the Seismic Program Swarm. I believe the closest station was YLT, and this is at Yellowstone. Again, guys, at West Thumb Lake at Yellowstone. A typical Rapid Fire Swarm, nothing too major. It's about moderate compared to other Rapid Fire Swarms that do occur every now and then around West Thumb and Yellowstone Lake. Usually related to um, fluid migration, hydrothermal or magmatic, I'm not sure, but usually fluid migration is responsible for these type of very fast-paced and energetic quick bursts of seismicity they usually only last about an hour or two at max and then calm down to background levels as you can see kind of happened here let's take a look at ylt and the seismic program swarm and just see how many events were in this swarm that lasted less than an hour actually here you have the seismic station ylt in the wy network zero one location code short period vertical now it does seem like this swarm lasted less than an hour's Pretty small compared to other rapid fire swarms I have seen, but of course I'm not going to just not talk about it. Got to talk about it when it happens at Yellowstone, guys. Yellowstone is my passion. That's where all my interest in volcanology and seismology began was with Yellowstone. So Yellowstone's my first love. Oh, yeah. You see, again, the typical rapid fire swarm, which I call a rapid fire swarm when events happen multiple times in less than a minute. For example, here's 8-11. And here's A12. Notice multiple events happening in just one minute, very closely spaced, sometimes with a rhythm and sometimes not. Very, very tiny, though. A lot of them are very tiny, probably less than magnitude 0.5. But then as the swarm progressed, we did see bigger and bigger magnitudes, probably around 1.0 to 1.5 right here for these earthquakes. Not too sure, though. Uh, going forward, I believe the largest right here is a 2.3... I'm thinking this one was a 2.3, some dominant lower frequencies with this earthquake, which was very shocking to me, actually. Some strong, strong lower frequencies. You notice that right there? And it looks a little bit different than some of the other earthquakes. It's not a low frequency earthquake, but it did have some very strong lower frequencies. Uh, and going forward, we see that these are all part of the earthquake swarm. A lot of times earthquakes striking in such close proximity, they blend to create a tremor-like event. That does happen a lot, guys. Sometimes earthquakes are hard to, to take apart when they're that close together. Now, look at the energy involved in some of this swarming, guys. Look at how many occur in just two minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Approximately ten or eleven earthquakes. Very small, of course, in about two minutes. Yeah, that's pretty energetic, guys. That's pretty energetic. Then a weird emergent event right here taking part of this earthquake swarm, but these are likely multiple tiny, tiny, tiny earthquakes occurring in such rapid succession, you just can't separate them with your human eye. Going forward, still seeing some more. Got another one right here, probably magnitude 1.8 or so. Then we had another one right here, probably magnitude 1, 0 0.8, I'm going to say. Going forward, we still see that the swarm was ongoing for a little while, but that started to die down. Saw another burst, actually, right here with the largest event at the beginning, and it's slowly dying down. Notice how the strength of each event basically went down with each subsequent event. Notice that. I think that's pretty interesting. Kind of like something was leaving. Like some type of fluid came up, tried to break the rock away, and then it started to withdraw from whatever it was doing. I don't know, guys. That happens a lot at Yellowstone because it has such a huge, diverse... Uh, hydrothermal system at Yellowstone. I believe it's the largest hydrothermal system in the world, which of course is powered by the huge volcanic system that lies underneath it, which some consider a super volcanic system, but, you know, not everything's considered a super volcano. Because it can have lava eruptions too, but you never know. Just keep a close eye on how the caldera is acting, guys. And that's that. Swarm started on November 30th at... 810 UTC and ended approximately and ended approximately same date at 844 UTC so it lasted about 34 minutes so pretty short for an earthquake swarm but then again a lot of events for only 34 minutes since they were occurring in such rapid success excuse me succession so I thought that was pretty interesting and one last thing to add to this video is the recent seismicity near Albania in Greece. Now, first off, there's a very deadly earthquake that struck Albania not too long ago. Let's see the exact date. Let's see here. We saw a magnitude 6.4, 20 kilometers in depth with an extreme, did you feel it, report, meaning extreme violent shaking. I mean, probably like the worst shaking you could ever imagine is supposed to be red because it doesn't quite get much worse than red. Um... And November 26, 2019 at 254 UTC, I believe I was at work when I saw this happen, or when I saw it appear on the Earthquake app. 
Very, very intriguing, guys. Many, many aftershocks. 5.1, 5.3, 4.6, including a strong aftershock of a 5.4, which did show up as a level 7, did you feel, a report. So pretty, pretty intense right there, guys. Pretty intense. And it did, the 6.4 did kill a few people. It was felt by many in the region. Surprisingly, people did report it to USGS because not many people know about USGS out there since really we're, it's a United States government organization i i mean i mean over here we're never thought about at all by by the europeans you know they're like who is usgs but 1344 people did report feeling it with a very strange moment tensor and they do have a tectonic summary if you want to go read that at the event page but it's just saying what happened basically and then later on the next day a little over 24 hours later, we saw 6.0 in Greece at 71.8 kilometers in depth, so much deeper than the original event up here. I still have the seismic data from the original 6.4 in Albania at 20 kilometers. And it's from a foreign database, which means if you don't know how to access directly from those seismic stations without a data select server, I'm talking about literally gathering the data straight from the instruments via the internet. I mean, you won't be able to find the data unless you know how to do that. Good thing I know how to do that, and I'm willing to teach you if anyone's willing to learn, but it is kind of a long and involved process. I believe it is PDG in the MN network we are going to take a look at real quick. So here you have the seismic data from Albania, from the closest seismic station to this event in their foreign network that they have. Now, sadly, when you go to the spectrogram, you notice only 10 hertz. If it says that automatically, this station will not go beyond 10 hertz. Sadly, it's one of their older stations. Still broadband stations, so I'm going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter to the 8th power. But again, if you're going to look for any low frequency activity, since it's at 10 hertz at the maximum right here for the spectrogram, you'd see any low frequency events being about halfway down the spectrogram. But we do see this is the magnitude 6.4, guys, in Albania that collapsed many houses, killed a good amount of people. Well, not good amount, but you know what I mean. It definitely was very strong, guys. Very strong. And I wish they would update a lot of their instruments in this location because, yeah, it's just, yeah, too low of a frequency range. I mean, it's, it gets a little annoying sometimes. And I believe this is the 5.4 aftershock, I believe, if I'm correct, right here. Yeah, it was pretty strong size misty for the day, guys, going forward continued aftershocks and they just kept going on and going on and going on a lot of them probably being felt by those people in albania yeah and just to, to let's take a quick look at historical seismicity magnitude 5.0 and above for albania so ever since november 25th 1950 to right now december 1st 2019 there have been 109 reported earthquakes magnitude 5.0 and above and we're going to take a look. Look look at this. All along the shores, we see this type of activity all along this entire area. But let's go to the largest since 1950. We're going to hit largest magnitude first. Largest was 6.9 in 1979, just to the north in Montenegro. That is 6.7 in Albania. So since 1950, the 6.4 recently in Albania was the fourth strongest earthquake. I don't know about a time period prior to that, but since 1950 to right now, the 6.4 in Albania recently on the 26th was the fourth largest event to hit the region, at least this region right here. So I find that pretty interesting, guys. Pretty interesting. Now, let's go back real quick, see if any crazy events happened while I was recording. Let's go here. Not really, guys. Nothing too crazy right now. Haven't seen spasmodic tremor in Hawaii for a while, but the Mauna Loa summit, the Kilauea summit, and the Kilauea Easter zone continue to swell and to bulge upwards. And that Hawaiian slump activity is slowly sliding towards the sea. Who knows when it'll break off or if it will ever break off, but it's definitely sliding towards the sea. And even HVO confirms that. So just keep an eye out for that. Remember to check my website for many different things and contact me via email if you have anything important. I love you guys. God bless, and I'll probably see you next week. Keep an eye out for the next Steamboat Geyser eruption, which I will not make a video about, but I will put it on my website once I know it happens. I'm going to guess it's going to erupt Tuesday or Wednesday night. That is my opinion. So, see you guys later. God bless.